Hey everyone, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to another OD Wire webinar. Thanks for coming out tonight. And uh, before we get started here, I just want to run over the ground rules for you. So uh, first things first, I know that um, tonight OD Wire is giving away a Starbucks uh, gift card, an e-gift card. Um, be on the lookout in your email box uh, for that in the next several days. You should receive it. If you don't, shoot me an email. Um, if for some reason it gets stuck in your spam folder or you don't see it, I can always resend it. Um, as you know, email is not always the most reliable thing, but fortunately for the most part, it goes through. Uh, I guess the other thing tonight is uh, on the right side of your screen, you'll see a little box there that says questions. As the <coughs> webinar unfolds tonight, please just do me a favor and type your question in that box. And what we're gonna do is hold it aside. Um, and then at the very end, we're gonna do a little verbal Q and A. So um, that's, those are my little PSAs. And I guess let's get, let's get down to the topic tonight. So OCT angiography applications in primary care featuring Optiview Solix by Visionix. It's a, it's a mouthful, but as you know, we've had a really great series here on the Solix, the, the new device that just came out within the, the past year. Um, that takes some really incredible images and can really enhance your patient care. And this is the latest webinar that we're doing. And fortunately, we have an expert with us tonight who has used the device in his practice for a while now and is gonna give you some real insight on how it works. So our guest tonight is Dr. John Warren. And I think you've probably seen John give webinars here on ODWire before. If you haven't, you've almost certainly read his work. He's published in all of the major optometric journals. He actually wrote his own EHRs as well, iCodeWrite, which you may have used or may have seen. So he's a true Renaissance man in, in what he writes about and what he lectures about. So he's the perfect person to sort of talk about the Solix and how he's using it and OCTA in general. So uh, with that said, John, I'm going to give you control and then you will be able to take it away. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate the, the nice intro there. Uh, if my voice sounds a little froggy, it's uh, ragweed season here in Wisconsin, and I'm a duck hunter, and I've been sitting out in the ragweed this last couple of weeks, so I get a little raspy. So if you hear me take a drink, it's my tea to try to keep my voice from, from cracking too much. Um, so as Adam said, I've, I've uh, been using OCT and OCTA for quite a while in my practice. Um, and, you know, I think to me, uh, OCTA has really become pretty mainstream data for me as far as... Um, uh, my patient care. Um, it, those of us that have an OCT in our practice um, have kind of realized how when you first bring the OCT and how much that revolutionizes primary uh, eye care, the, the data that it gives us about a whole host of our patients. Um, and to me, it's really it's really added my, to my diagnostic capabilities like no other uh, uh, diagnostic modality. To me, OCTA kind of does the same thing with regards to OCT data in that it adds so much more to uh, what I can what I can do for my patients, what I can do diagnostically. Um, uh, in Wisconsin, we have a pretty a pretty as taught leg legislation, but we're not doing injections or those sort of things. So it's not really a therapeutic device that I'm using it to drive my therapy, but it really allows me to make accurate and up to date diagnoses for my patients. And you know, OCTA really does complete the picture of what's going on in in the back of my patient's eyes. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Solix later on, um, not just so much OCTA, but also what some of its, its additional uh, capabilities that, that really make it stand out as a, a kind of the Swiss Army knife of anterior and posterior segment uh, imaging devices. Um, you know, many of these patients, um, I've got a unique practice in that I'm just a single single optometrist practicing in a, in a suburban area in, in Wisconsin but I've taken over an ophthalmology practice about nine or 10 years ago. So I have a fairly elderly patient base. Um, you know, we, we're running the Solix on probably 50% of our patients, maybe more uh, because of diagnoses and issues the patients have. The last time I checked my demographics, 80% of the patients were over 40 and 60% were over 60. So I have a lot of these patients that have multiple conditions that are diabetic and also have AMD uh, or, or AMD and have glaucoma. So many times I'm using, you know, one set of scans to evaluate many things on the same patient. Um, just like when I, I brought topography into my practice in 1998, um, you know, I can't imagine practicing without topography and aberrometry now. I, I, can't, I can't picture myself practicing without OCT and OCTA. It's that much of an impact on the quality of care and the care I can provide to my patients. <clears throat> So when do I use this wonderful technology that I'm going to talk about? And for me, it's it's you know it's not a, not to do a rule out specifically, but when I detect or suspect something, 
that OCT or OCTA will help fill, fulfill the, or fill out the clinical picture, that's when I'm going to be ordering this. Uh, whether I see it uh, in, in the fundus myself or on a photograph, um, maybe something else that I've done. Uh, patients where pressure is a concern, I'm going to use this in all my glaucoma workups. I'm going to talk a little bit about OCTA perfusion and glaucoma in a little bit. Um, and then or anytime there's an unexpected vision loss, a patient that, you know, based on aberometry and uh, lens opacities, that sort of thing, should be seeing better than they're seeing, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the macula. And it's, it's really surprising how many times those patients do have something going on that either the OCT aspect or the OCTA aspect will show things. Um, and then for Plaquenil, it's really an OCT issue, not so much OCTA, um, but I'm going to use it on all my Plaquenil patients also. Um, I also do use the eye wellness test for screening uh, as a screening for glaucoma. In my practice, we do it based on patient age or uh, basically every patient over 60. The first time we've seen them since we brought the Solex and we're using that. Um, or if I see a patient, I had one today who was fairly young in his mid 40s, but had large, large amounts of cupping. There were big nerves, big cups and a big nerve. But we can run that test so quickly that that it was a no brainer to have my staff take them back uh, and, and run that just to know that everything was okay. And, and fortunately with this patient, it wasn't a concern. Um, I also use it for fitting and evaluating scleral lenses. Um, the, the new anterior segment capability, the Solix is really pretty mind boggling. I can, I can image from the anterior segment of the cornea, see the full angle, and I can even see the back surface of a phacic patient's lens, um, which diagnostically isn't super useful, but it's a wonderful teaching tool for patients to show them the the loss of clarity of their cataract, how how much light's absorbed, those sort of things when you're looking at, at, at opacities. Um, so, and then when I'm screening before or during a physical vision correction patients, LASIK, PRK, uh, or intracorneal lenses, or for CRT, um, uh, you know, I'm gonna be looking at the epithelial thickness specifically for CRT, but also the corneal thickness for the other refractive procedures. And the pachymetry map is very helpful for that. I'll show you an example of, of using it in that way in a little bit. So when am I most likely to use specifically OCTA? And for me, it's the big three, uh, MACDGEN, diabetic retinopathy, and then glaucoma. Um, I still think we're kind of in the, the nascence of perfusion and OCTA and glaucoma, but I'm convinced that there is a, there is a nugget there. Um, you know, very much like when we were even looking in time domain OCTs at retinal, overall retinal thickness in the macula for early glaucoma detection, uh, assuming that it was the GCC thinning, even though we couldn't image it. Um, you know, I think with perfusion and having looked at enough patients now, uh, I've had OCTA in my practice about two years. I had an Avanti for a year and a half and then upgraded to the Solux when it came to the U.S., so I've got enough data on my patients that in some patients it does, it is very helpful diagnostically. Other things that I use the uh, OCTA for, hypertensive retinopathy, and then associated complications like a BRVO or a patient who's got a, an anterior, anterior nerve issue like an NAION, I'm obviously going to be running the, uh, the OCT and OCTA for that. Um, now with the Solix, it, it does a 3x3, a 6.4x6.4, three three, a, a 9x9, or a 12x12 12 12 OCTA. And those 12 by 12 OCTAs are pretty impressive uh, for diabetics and hypertensive patients. Um, and um, the diabetics, you can actually follow the, the foveal vascular zone a, a, upon initial presentation to see what it's shaped like and how its size, and then following it over time to see if there's been an, an increase in the size of the foveal vascular zone. Um, you know, I used to tell patients OCT and, and retinal thickness was really the first place I was going to find their retinopathy um, before we're going to see hemorrhage in a lot of cases uh, or exudate. Well, now a lot of times I'm seeing microvascular changes before I'm even seeing thickness changes. So it's one step earlier in the diabetic retinopathy uh, treatment treatment phase. So, you know, the, the big three really make up the bulk of what I'm using OCTA for in the back half of the eye or the Solix in the back half of the eye. Um, but hypertensive retinopathy is, is something, if you've got an older patient base like mine, it's, it's pretty interesting to see the loss in perfusion that these patients have, even without hemorrhage or exudate being present or, or frank thickening. Um, I've seen, read, been doing a little reading and seen a few articles talking about potentially using devices like the Solux just on pretty much all of our patients with a significant hypertension history because of the, the positive findings that we have. So how does OCTA work? Um, I think it's important you have a basic understanding of how we, we develop these, 
my vascular and microvascular maps. Um, but it uses o it uses two OCT B scans. Um, it captures the one right after the other. Uh, it does a horizontal oriented scan that is then then does a vertically oriented scan, and then those scans are compared by software that subtracts out any motion artifacts. So it has to be able to register and track the eye. And you can turn tracking off if you need to uh, on the Solux, but it's usually not necessary. And when you do, you don't get quite as good a result. But those two scans are then compared. And differences between those two scans taken back to back are looked at. And you know anything that's different is movement in the back of the eye. And there's really only one thing moving in the back of the eye, and that's blood. Um, so by looking for movement, identifying the vascular tree, and then the microvasculature, um, we're able to, to actually build these, these incredibly powerful uh, maps or angiographies that we have for our patients. So um, saccadic movements are, are calculated out, then uh, that's one of the big things. As you learn to, to look at these um, different layers of the angiography, um, but it, it takes out any of the saccadic um, movements. You sometimes get what are called projection artifacts where more, more anterior um, vessels will cast a shadow that you have to be able to, to, to look at these. It's not difficult data to look at, but it is, you know, there's a learning curve to it. Um, Visionics has, has had a, a, an academy uh, for OCT, OCTA, and, and it's being revamped and improved uh, kind of as we speak to, to make it easy for people that, that add OCTA to, to put it into clinical use pretty quickly. So what does OCTA tell me? Uh, you know, the angiography shows me the vasculature and more importantly, the microvasculature in the back part of the eye. Um, you know, it's occasionally I'll see, you know, vascular issues, but usually it's microvascular concerns that I'm seeing in the back of the eye. Um, and, you know, it's tremendously important to know, is there, is there not vascularization and perfusion in the back of the eye providing tissue with, um, with nu nutrients and then also drainage in, in the venous system? So you're seeing arteries and veins in the back part of the eye. Uh, and diabetic retinopathy, vein occlusions, uh, those sort of things, you're looking more at the anterior, anterior structures or anterior layers in the retina. Um, glaucoma, you're looking more in the middle, uh, the, some superficial in the middle. And you're looking for presence of Irma, microaneurysms, um, and, then, and then lack of perfusion is what you're looking for. Um, in, uh, if you see neovascularization, it can be on the surface in a diabetic or a hypertensive patient, um, but the more common application of this is looking for uh, submacular, um, subretinal neovascular membranes in uh, MACDGEN patients. I've got a case of that that I'm going to show you. And then looking at ischemic conditions with, say, a CR, or BRVO or a BRAO, um, we're going to be looking just to see loss of blood supply in certain areas. Um, you know, uh, fluorescein angiogram has kind of been the, the gold standard for angiography for years, and it's still a very useful clinical tool. OCTA does not 100% replace fluorescein angiography. Um, but the one thing OCTA can tell me that fluorescein doesn't is the depth of perfusion or loss of perfusion. Um, because of the way uh, the fluorescein angiography data is gathered, you can just see is there flow or not. You can't see what level is it in. You can make some assumptions based on time to fill and, and those sort of things. Um, but it, uh, it does not show you the depth. Um, one of the things you need to wrap your mind around as you're using this is that different conditions will affect different depths, and we just refer to them as slabs in OCTA. There's really four slabs we're looking at in, in the, the eye for retinal conditions, and diabetic ret retinopathy affects <clears throat> more of the superficial and then the deep layers uh, or slabs. Um, and, you know, I'm typically looking for ischemia, irma microvascular aneurys microaneurysms, and potentially NVE and NVD. So, and specifically NVD or maybe chantra collateral vessels near the, near the optic nerve head. In MACDGEN, we're looking more at the outer retina and the choriocapillaris to see do we have new blood vessels growing where there ought not be new blood vessels, uh, looking for SRNVs. And this is one of the really interesting, we can't see the leakage from these, from these, um, these uh, new vessels or other things. It doesn't show leakage like fluorescein does. That's where fluorescein really stands out. Um, but we can certainly see if these membranes are present and we can actually measure them. We can measure how big an area there is and we can compare it over time. If someone, if a patient goes out with wet MACDGEN, um, has an ILEA or a Vastin injection and comes back four months or six months later after a series of injections, I can actually follow the, the resolution or lack of resolution if, if we're not having effect. Um, 
for those patients. So it's uh, really powerful information to have for the AMD patients. And, and in seconds, I can tell the patient you have dry macular degeneration. I may be looking for more subtle findings to see are they showing suggestions of transitioning, but I can really tell them very quickly if they do or don't. And in glaucoma, I'm looking at the parapapillary area primarily. Um, I think we'll be looking a little more macular perfusion also uh, with, the, with the ganglion cell complex. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing. We're not real sure if we have perfusion dropout that causes structural loss, which then causes uh, functional loss, or if we have structural loss that then removes the need for perfusion in that area because there's no tissue to support, and then do we have atrophy of the perfusion? And I think there's there's a little bit of both uh, going on. I think a lot of patients have multiple multimodal glaucoma where it may, be, may start with pressure and end with vascular or maybe just start with vascular issues. So the more I learn about the glaucoma, about glaucoma, the more I know what I don't know. Um, and the uh, Solix has what's called OCTA angiolytics, which uh, creates numeric data in sectors inferior, superior, and then, and then also in, in four quadrants. And it color codes the vascular density uh, in the reports. So it makes it very easy to follow change over time. Um, you can either visualize just the, the bare vascular, vascular microvascular tree, or you can actually look at the angiolytic reports and see uh, it really enhances areas where there's dropout especially. Um, these areas will, the, where there's the FAZ, as I mentioned, you can measure that. It will become larger and more irregular in diabetics. Uh, you can compare it over time. And as I alluded to earlier with uh, uh, subretinal neovascular membranes, you can actually measure them and you can get the, you know, calculate the area of flow, how much flow within an, an area there is and see if it's increasing or decreasing over time. So uh, the angiolytics are very powerful as a, far to way, as a way to compare things to a normative database and then also to um, very quickly see are things, is there new, new loss or is it progressing or regressing? So what doesn't OCTA show me? Um, doesn't show me leakage from vessels. Um, it's not like a fluorescein where you can watch for late phase and see the leakage and, and hopefully identify where it's coming from. Um, I've been practicing long enough, 30, 30 plus years, that I remember focal laser and low energy laser and all the other things we used to do in the back in the, the stone ages of retinal care uh, for AMD. And leakage was a big deal. We really, really needed that information. Um, but OCTA looks for blood flow, not the presence of, of red blood cells. Red, red blood cells. So, if you have a, a large blood hemorrhage or a large uh, flame hemorrhage in the nerve fiber layer, you're not going to see that on OCTA. Um, in fact, um, you know, non, uh, in fact, loose blood, you know, dense vitriol, dense vitriol or anterior retinal hemorrhages are are a bad thing if you're trying to image somebody with OCTA or OCT because they're going to block the light. The laser is going to be diminished or totally blocked, and you're going to have shadows and artifacts in your your OCT and OCTA data. So that's what I can't see with OCTA is loose blood. Um, it, you may see some haze in the vitreous if there's a hemorrhage and you may be able to appreciate where that's located with some of these full depth scans, but you're not going to be able to detect the, the presence of it with the OCTA. So a quick summary of OCTA is that it shows me the presence or absence of blood flow, shows me the depth or location of that, that blood flow within the retina from anterior to posterior, unlike fluorescein. Um, it allows me to, to really prevent unnecessary referrals. When you have those patients, you look in there with your 90 adapter lens and you do all your imaging, you do your OCT and you go, gosh, is there, is there something going on underneath that RPE? Um, or in the RPE, you can actually um, tell, tell if it is now or not. And I'm much more confident referring or not referring patients. Um, you know, I, I get to make a much more definitive diagnosis. I've got the, the, the luxury, I've got a, a private retina practice that I refer to that I'm actually able to share my OCT, OCTA, my images, everything with that physician. So when he walks in the room the first time with the patient, he's already seen what I've done with them, um, has my attentive diagnosis, then he goes in and, and does his thing and it works out very well for patients. Um, he's still going to be imaging them on his own because he wants his own tech, his own, own device, know exactly what's going on, but it really gives him a better feel for what he's walking into the room to. Um, you know, it lets me find things in diabetic retinopathy sooner. Um, I used to think that the earliest phase of really detecting this was uh, early retinal thickening. Now we can actually see that microvascular dropout, uh, which you know, is con concurrent with or precedes uh, the edema that we'll see. Um, and it just makes me a better diagnost diagnostician. 
one of the things I like to say, whether you're using refractive technology or using imaging technologies, you have to trust the technology. And I'm not saying the technology replaces me, but when the technology tells me something's going on, I need to listen. Um, and you know, if it tells me there's nothing going on, I need to listen to that too. Um, I still may change my, my follow-up pattern based on just my clinical gut or other things, but it's real important to trust the technology we're working with. So I wanna show you a few quick cases of how I apply OCTA in my practice. Um, the, um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and run through 25 different cases and seven different retinopathy cases and other things, but I did want to share with you some of the things that, that I do with my patients and how it's benefited my patients to have OCTA. And a couple of these, specifically the um, wider field OCTAs that I can get, especially the 12, uh, 12 millimeter by 12 millimeter scan. Um, so this is, you know, I, I had alluded to referrals and, and do I need to or not need to refer a patient? Uh, Larry's a, a gentleman. I've been seeing him for about eight years. Um, he's had AMD the whole time that I've been following him. Fortunately, his, his acuities are still pretty good. Um, he's got some vitreo macular traction also. Um, and that's something I didn't really talk about because it's more of a straight OCT issue. Um, but when you start using OCT or OCTA more with your patients, uh, you'll be really surprised how many of your patients do have um, that have epiretinal membranes do have mild to moderate vitreomacular traction. Um, the, uh, the incidence is much higher than you would think just looking at the eye with a 90 adapter lens or a um, super, super field uh, fundus lens, whatever you might be using for your fundus exam. Um, his systemic health is positive for hypertension um, and some vascular disease, but he's never had any strokes, anything along those lines. I think he's taken a baby aspirin, but nothing, nothing aggressive as far as that goes. So. Um, this is just a, a fundus photo, sorry for the glare and reflection that's on there, um, but I've got an arrow pointing to the area that's of most concern that I'm wondering what is going on underneath that, that spot. Um, you know, he doesn't have a whole lot of drusen scattered throughout the posterior pole. They're all, in his case, kind of superior temporal to the, to the uh, foveal pit. And when you take a look at his OCT scan, I've got the arrow pointing to that, that area that we're looking at. And lo and behold, he does have an area where he's got a, a, a drusenoid PED, um, and it looks like he's got some new blood vessels growing underneath there. And when you look at the upper right red arrow, you can see it pointing right to that net. Um, I, had, I have sent him out, and he is, is seeing my, my retinologist. He's had some ILEA injections. Um, I have not seen him back yet since I referred him out for this. But I had watched him for about three to four years with OCTA, and then about a year and a half with um, with uh, the Avanti and he did not have that membrane. As soon as that showed up, off you went to uh, see the, the retinologist who actually has my same last name, but it's no, uh, uh, no, no relation. Um, and he's been having, uh, been having some uh, inje ILEA injections. I think he's been spread out to about five to six weeks right now is where he's at. Um, you can also see it's his other eye that's got more of the vitreomacular traction. One of the other things you'll see are these drusenoid PEDs that are to the left of where the lower red arrow is. Um, you know, you, you start seeing those. When I talked about the angiolytics, um, the bottom left diagram that's got a lot of blue color does show that he may have some, some dropout or some, some loss of perfusion. But this is one of those cases where in about two seconds of looking at this scan, I knew that Larry needed to go and, and, be, and be looked at by my retinologist. So it's a case of being confident in the referral. Um, you know, when that wasn't present, I was very comfortable following every, him every four to six months. And, you know, he's a snowbird, so I get him, I get him in fall. I just saw him. Um, and uh, I'll be seeing him again in May when he comes back in. So um, the, uh, you know, the retinologist and I share his care fairly well. Um, this is a diabetic that we none of us want to see. Uh, Ruben's a wonderful guy, Hispanic uh, male with a long history of type one. I want to say he's he wasn't he wasn't diagnosed at age seven, but he was in his mid teens when when he uh, became diabetic. So he's got about 30 years of diabetes behind him. Um, and anybody who's as old as I am and, and a college basketball fan remembers Dick Vitale and his Dow Jones or his kids that were up and down and up and down. That's his blood sugar. Um, he's like the stock market. He goes up, he goes down. He goes up, he goes down. Um, and he's also not real consistent with his follow-up with me um, and with, with retina. He's been 
lost to follow up by both of us uh, on and off over the last four or five years. Um, he's a little tough to manage. It's actually been a little easier to manage him with some of the better imaging I have now, not just the OCTA, but fundus imaging to say, look, this is what's going on and this is why we need to, to do these things for you and to you. Um, other than his diabetes, he's in, in pretty good health. He doesn't, he's in, in Wisconsin, we have lots of diabetics who are hyperlipidemic and, and also hypertensive, but he's actually in pretty good shape otherwise. And fortunately, his uncorrected vision is outstanding. So, um, you know, he sees well, it's hard for him to buy into the fact he's got some serious problems we really need to be worried about. Um, but, uh, you know, Ruben still sees pretty well, fortunately, for now. Um, this is his right eye, and you can see the dot and blot hemorrhages are actually worse, and in, in, I would say nasal to the nerve than, than, than temporal, not, but not that there's nothing temporal. And fortunately, his macula is fairly clear of um, significant, significant hemorrhage or exudate. If you look at the left eye, and it's a fairly similar picture um, where he's got widespread, right, widespread retinopathy. He also, coming off his optic nerve, has a very prominent uh, vitreous face. You'll see that in the OCT. You can kind of see the, the, the grayish or the goldish color to that. When, when I show you the OCT, you'll be able to see that very well. Um, but he doesn't really have any real vitreomacular traction from that as of yet. Our retinologist and I are concerned that he's going to develop that, um, either as a result of the, the uh, epiretinal membrane vitreous face contracting or uh, some diabetic factors. This is the bilateral vascular tree, and you can see that he has lots of dropout just looking at the naked uh, perfusion map. Off to the far left in the right eye or temporal in the left eye, there's certainly lots of dropout, probably worse superior than it is inferior. Um, the foveal vascular zone doesn't look too bad. It's enlarged somewhat. It's sort of irregular. He's got some microaneurysms popping up temporal to the to the fovea, um, but the the left eye is the bigger concern. You can see that there's a lot of dropout. Um, you know, he's probably lost you know, temporal to his his foveal pit. He's probably lost 15 to 20 percent of his vascular tree or micro microvascular. Um, when you look at the to the right of the image, I just, I don't have a pointer to show you, but you can see the Alphas slab, where it refers to the slabs. This is the superior, or the most, the most towards the vitreous face slab that we have. Um, you can go deep, you know, for diabetics, you're looking at superficial and you're looking at deep as the, the two that are of, of most interest. And you can see in, in this view, this is the same scan, just a smaller representation of it. Um, but you can see on, on the left is the superficial, which we were just looking at. And then the next one over is to the right is the deep. And you can see there's, there's loss in the deep zone also. Um, and that's where you're going to see most of your loss in the diabetic is, is superficial and then some in the deep. But you can also see this uh, vitreous face here and he's got some traction. But the thing that concerns me the most about him are these cystic changes that he's got in the fovea. And those are the main thing that caused me to send him out to the retinologist um, to see if we can't uh, maybe mitigate that slightly. Um, he is having some, some injections and I've not seen him back since I did this scan on the Solix. So I, have, I don't have a follow-up scan to show you to see if he's resolved. I should be seeing him back probably in December. Along the bottom of the report, you can see the ganglion cell thickness or basically the, the anterior thickness and then the inner, and then the outer thickness, and then the overall retinal, full retinal thickness. And you can see it on the far right bottom that there really isn't any real uh, significant edema. He does have a little thinning down here, inferior nasal, or I'm sorry, inferior temporal, which goes along with that area that doesn't have perfusion. So he's he's you know got some atrophy due to the uh, uh, the lack of perfusion. And so I usually look at this scan first, just to quickly look and see what do I need, where do I need to spend more time. Then I'll blow it up to the larger scans to see uh, more details on things. And this this is again, this is just the left eye superficial, um, but where it's just one eye, a little bit bigger scan. And you can see this the vitreous uh, face here. We're we're concerned he's got some tugging. We just don't want to see more traction develop. I don't think it is playing a role in the cystic space. I think that's more uh, diabetes driven, uh, but retina and I are watching him close and retina is treating him. Um, and this is, you can see that was a superficial, this is the deep scan, a little bit larger. And you can see he's got lots of dropout in through here 
and up in here. The macula has been relatively spared to date um, with that, uh, but I've got a feeling that's going to go south on us here at some point. And then these are the color thickness uh, maps that uh, that you can you can show, and you can jump from different uh, <clears throat> you can jump to different uh, thickness, whether it's thickness or the alphas or whatever it is you want to look at. So, um, and you can change whether you're going to see the ganglion cell thickness here or the full retinal thickness, as I've got it shown here, which is more useful for a diabetic. Um, this is a patient. She's one of my favorite patients. Um, she's 69. She's very involved in her health care. She's inquisitive. I always have interesting things, unfortunately, to show her about her eye. And now she has stage four pancreatic cancer. So I don't think we'll be taking care of her too much longer, but she's got the warrior mentality. So we'll see where things go. Um, she's had a, a BRVO in 2017 that I've been following. I usually see her every six months, and retina sees her to do injections as need be. Um, but I want to follow her lens, her her pressures, and you know, kind of her her overall eye care, and let her you know have a quarterback to her eye care. I found if I just send them off to retina and don't see them back again, the, their primary their primary eye care tends to suffer. And um, a lot of these people have many factors that that can affect their eyes, so I do try to see them every six to twelve months, even if they're seeing retina at the intervening times. Um, so over, over the years, her uh, BRVO has kind of waxed and waned in this presentation. It's inferior. You can see the, the, the corkscrew vessels and you can see the, the, the some shunt vessels here. <clears throat> and, you know, at, at this photo, without zooming it in, it doesn't look all that bad. Um, but I can tell you when we look at the OCTA and OCT down in this area, you're going to really see some things that, that aren't so bueno. Um, this is just a, an OU scan real quickly. Um, and here you can see that the small, the small superficial maps. I'll blow those up in a minute so you can see the left one and see the the uh, superficial and the deep uh, perfusion loss. Um, and you can also see the retina thickness and the, the inner and out, or the full retinal thickness and the inner retinal thickness. Um, you can select and change what's shown on these maps. If I clicked on vessel density here in a live scan, it would actually show me the the angiolytics too, which you're going to see in a moment. So this is um, blown up a little bit bigger, so you can appreciate the superficial and the deep scans and the lack of, of perfusion. And then looking at the GCC thickness and the overall thickness, there's a lot of atrophy that's going on here. Um, she had some pretty significant venous stasis retinopathy going on where just, there just was not much moving through there as far as nutrition and there was not much, not much being cleared either. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can even see the the ragged appearance too. This is the the, the superior to inferior scan, so the far right is inferior. You can even visualize the retinal thinning that's going on there. So, um, you know, there's quite a bit going on inferiorly. Fortunately, her vision is still pretty good. I want to say she's 20-30 in that eye. Her macula has been somewhat spared. Um, this is showing the the uh, perfusion, uh, the superficial perfusion, and then. Um, you can see there is a little bit of edema here to go along with this inferior atrophy. With, with these 12 by 12 scans, I can visualize this so much better than I used to be able to. Um, with the Avanti, it was a six by six scan. So I was pretty much from here over to here and up was what I was seeing, which has clinical use. It tells you about the macula and where they're sent, what their central vision is doing. But for these vasculopathy patients, these scans are extremely powerful. Um, uh, pieces of clinical data to use, patient education, and following for progression or regression. And then this is looking at the superficial, and then the next one should be the deep uh, deep perfusion that you have here. So you can see that, that in her case, both superficial and deep have been significantly affected. Um, so it's one of those cases, it's a very sad case where she probably won't be with us too much longer, um, but it's been very, rewarding and interesting to take care of her over the years. Um, now with glaucoma, I mentioned the chicken or the egg, and that's the, you know, does loss of perfusion cause structural damage, which causes functional damage, or do we have structural damage, but then, which then removes the need for perfusion, and so the, the body being lazy, you know, the perfusion atrophies. I think in some patients it's one, and in some patients the other, and in some patients it's both. So that's just my clinical gut feeling. Um, Jane's a 73-year-old white female, just saw her recently. Um, I first diagnosed her with glaucoma in 2020. I've been seeing her for quite a while, and 
um, one of those interesting patients that develops glaucoma on your watch. Um, you know, and it was uh, it was more her nerve changes. You can see when you look at her pressures, the pressure was never a concern on its own. Um, but you can see what happened in that in the right eye. As far as the cup to disc ratio, it's certainly gone up over time. So, um, you know, she's had disc changes, which caused me to look at other things and say there's something else going on here. These are her fields. The left eye relatively clear. She's got a little superior defect, but the 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 right eye has certainly got inferior defect. And you'll see when we look at the OCTA, you'll, OCT and OCTA, you'll see what's going on. Um, and here comes the the OU report, which I just, I, I know uh, there have been a couple other webinars showing this report and it's just, a, I saw one, my Solix was on order, it hadn't shown up yet. And I saw one of these reports in a webinar and went, wow, I can't wait. Um, so you can see the RNFL thickness. There's definitely lots of, of, uh, of thinning. Ganglion cell complex is not wiped out, but it's greatly thinned um, throughout the whole right eye. Left eye, it's more inferior, which would account for that superior field defect. Now, when you look at the RNFL thickness, and then you take a look at the the, the angiolytic perfusion map down below, um, you can see that there certainly is some dropout. Dark blue is is less perfusion. Certainly, some dropout in the area that in the left eye that correlates with the retinal fiber nerve fiber layer thinning, and the same thing in the right eye, superior and inferior. You can actually see where where the uh, oh, this build isn't quite working right. Let me go back. Um, I want to draw your attention to that. The circles are showing you where, you know, where that perfusion really, really aligns with the structural loss that's there, and it goes along with the field loss also. And it's from seeing patients like this for really almost two years now that that has really got me rethinking some of my my thoughts about glaucoma and you know what what's causing these optic nerves to get sick in some patients. And a patient like this, she maybe a, a perfusion issue where it's much more a vascular problem for her as you saw from her pressure it was never much over 20 21 um and you know we've all been taking care of patients for a while that have low tension glaucoma and i think they probably have vascular glaucoma more than they have the tension glaucoma issue um you know then they may feed on each other as as we lose t lose structure over time but um you know when you take a look I'm, I'm much more into into graphical there's a ton of numerical data here that i think over time is going to be worth following these specific numerical values for change um but i tend to spend a lot more time looking at the pretty pictures um, much more graphical with my analysis of these things and you can certainly see that the perfusion goes right along with the structural losses there so in my my clinical gut i know there's something going on there um, these are some of her older scans from the the Avanti, which looks similar. The, the reports in the Solux are much better and much more much more robust. Um, but I wanted to show some of the things that she'd had before. These these are uh, uh, what she had done before as far as her her perfusion uh, in the parapapillary area. Um, the lower are the two scans from the Solux that I just added in. And then the uppers are the previous ones for the Avanti. And you can see it looks pretty stable in the in the in the left eye, maybe a little different, but pretty stable. Um, but in the right eye, I think we've got certainly some more superior thinning. It's it's a little artifactual here because I've got this blown up larger just because it's easier to see. Um, and these are the, this is the same data pulled off the Solux report, just laid next to the uh, uh, the Avanti data. One of the things that people will ask me, they'll say, you know, I have whatever OCT it is. And I'd like to add OCTA, but isn't it really painful to change OCTs? And there is, certainly is, there is some, some pain to deal with. Um, the thing is normative databases are nice once, and that's only the first time you image someone on that device. Um, after that, the patient becomes their own normative database, assuming that the, the scans are of good quality each time you see the patient. So it's really for about a year that you're dealing with the transition because you're gonna scan a patient on the Solix and compare it to whatever you had before. And you know the next time the patient sends specific glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, AMD patients are coming in every four to six months. So probably six months after the first scan, you're gonna have your second piece of data. You're back in the game following them, and you know the the transition is behind you. I think I'm on my fifth or technically my sixth OCT uh, since 2003. Um, so I've gone through this before. Um, I do like to live on the bleeding edge of technology, and I, I pay a price for it sometimes with more work for myself, but um, you know, 
it's important to me, it's important enough to add OCTA that if you have a different OCT um, and you want to go to OCTA, it's worth the, any pain you might have in making the change. Um, and then these are just uh, blow-ups of upper, upper fields. Um, or no, I'm sorry, this is another patient. I don't have her demographics written up here, but uh, Marilyn has uh, been a, a patient of mine for about 25 years and developed glaucoma while I was taking care of her. Um, and you can see she's got some, some moderate field loss in, in both eyes, um, a little more concerning in the left than in the right, but it's, it's present in both. And when we take a look at her, her uh, angiography report, this is her right eye on uh, the right eye field over here. You can see she's got the inferior GCC thinning, which goes along with this, this field defect. She's got some, some superior thinning, which would account for that, that uh, nasal step. Um, but you can also see the perfusion here. There's definitely dropout in these areas where she's got RNFL loss. So it's definitely something that correlates. And here's the other eye. Uh, in the uh, left eye, you can see she's got the GCC thinning and the, the nasal step, but you can also see all this thinning in the parapapillary area where, this, where those either causing death of these ganglion cells or the death of the ganglion cells has resulted in the dropout of this perfusion but it's really another check on your data. And I think in some patients, I'm starting to see perfusion progression before I'm seeing OCT progression. Um, I can't hang my hat on that and say that it's definitely there, but I think we're gonna see more of that coming out in the next four to five years as we clinically apply this to more and more patients. One of the other things the Solix does is it does do color fundus photos. These are just some, some photos we snapped to my, one of my technicians, undilated just to have some images to, to show you what's going on. And you can, you can enhance the images, you can zoom them, you can color separate them, you can manipulate them like you would any other camera. Um, and for scleral lenses, the anterior segment OCT is, is staggering. Um, Mark's been a patient forever. He was a 16 cut RK in the 90s by a practice that, not my practice, not the one I was in, um, and uh, eventually had some corneal uh, instability and went to a scleral lens, was doing very well. Um, and then he um, ended up having a, a his, his graft uh, uh, reject, or I mean, ended up having a, a full thickness PK um, as his cornea just wore out. And um, I had refit him in a scleral lens, was doing well. And then he popped a couple of his superior, um, superior uh, nasal sutures up here and caused him to have me, me to have to refit him. And this is what you can see with the Solix. You can see edge to edge on your scleral lenses. You can see the cornea very well, and you can see what's here for tear layer. Um, this is the lens I refit from. I needed to get more clearance right in here. You can actually turn these scans. This, the default is, a, is it 180 degrees? You can, you can, as you, you'll see in a second, you can twist it. I think it's every 10 degrees. You can, you can change that, that scan. Um, this next scan is, is vertical. Um, you can see we've got a little better clearance here. It's, it's away from this superior nasal area where that's of a concern. This next one, I think, sits on the superior nasal area, catching this big hump that he's got in the cornea. But it's tremendous for looking at the edge profile of the lens and then also the filling. He does have some decent mucus in there. I think it's from irritation right in this point. Um, and a little, little more clearance than I'd really want. And then this is back at, at the other degree or at, at 45 degrees. What I had to do is have my staff take these four images when a scleral lens patient comes in for a follow-up. So I can take a look at these, I'll look at them on the slit lamp and then discuss what's going on with the fit. Um, the other thing I alluded to is uh, pachymetry and epithelial thickness. And you know I've been doing this long enough, we used to think we were bending corneas, but we're actually uh, moving epithelium. And if you take a look at the topography maps here in the right and in the left eye, and then you take a look at the um, epithelial thickness maps, you can see where I'm pushing epithelium. I'm shoving it from the middle and putting it around the outside. And that holds up or bears up quite well. Um, you don't really see it on the co total corneal thickness because it's, it's such a small change compared to the whole corneal thickness, but at the epithelial level, it really, really shows up well. And there's a highlight tool you can hit here to make that stand out even more if you'd like to. Um, I like to look at it this way first, and then I'll turn on the highlight tool and just see what a difference it makes in, in the way I see things. Um, but I'll use these maps for my glaucoma patients uh, for just to have pachymetry, and then I'll also use them to screen for um, uh, PRK and LASIK 
Um, interestingly, I did a scleral lens follow up today, and the at the 180 on his left on his left eye, we actually caught the uh, um, uh, corneal incision from his uh, his uh, cataract procedure, and it was actually incredible to, sh to see this and show it to the patient. I didn't grab it for the presentation tonight, but it'll be showing up in another one that I'm going to do. So to wrap, <coughs> to wrap, <coughs> excuse me, to wrap this up, OCTA just gives me a ton of clinical data uh, that's relevant for, for my patients in so many ways. Um, it allows me to keep my patients in my office until they really need to be referred. I'm not keeping them longer than I should, but I'm you know, the patients that I'm on the fence about, a lot of times I'm now comfortable or I'm less comfortable and I, I refer them sooner. Um, you know, it saves the patient's time to not have to just go see retina, get a fluorescein done and be told it's dry, you know, come back in four months or six months. Um, and then it saves patients money by not having those visits. Um, it does provide me with some additional revenue um, because I'm seeing these patients and providing that care. Um, and it prevents that drift that happens. Uh, you know, hopefully none of you are referring your retina cases to general ophthalmology. Hopefully your diabetics with retinopathy and your MACTOGEN patients with these injections are going off to tertiary care to, to retina practice. If you have one, I mean, if you're so rural that you don't have one, you, you have to use those, what's the, the tools available to you. Um, just quickly on coding and billing, OCT and OCTA have the same procedure codes as of now, uh, the, the retina and, and the optic nerve scan. Um, documents are required, requirements are the same as standard OCT, same allowable codes that you would have for OCT. Um, there are a few more for OCTA. Uh, hypertensive retinopathy, I know, is, is something I get reimbursed for. Um, I'm not sure if I get reimbursed on that for, well, I would. I guess I'd, in an audit, I'd be in better condition. Um, and then there's the same CPT to CPT coding combinations. Um, you know, you, can, you can't bill it with a photo, you can bill it with a field. You can't build a retina and an optic nerve uh, OCT same day. You can use some modifiers and do a few things um, to, to try to get those paid on the same day with different diagnoses. It's not something I've been doing. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but it's not something that I've been doing. So it's, it's a tool that really fits into primary care. It allows us to take better care of our patients. Um, it gives us a, you know, a, a better ROI than straight up OCT um, because it's, it's gonna let us uh, do more for our patients. And the anterior segment aspects of this device are staggering also. So I'd like to throw it open to questions, Adam, if you've got a few that you've got queued up and you wanna, wanna read to me or have anything. All right, thanks, John. And yes, yeah, so if anybody wants to ask questions, feel free to type in that question box on the right side of the screen and I will pop out my question box here and I can get started here. So let me pull this on out and we will see what's going on okay uh, so question here when you observe microvascular changes on octa when there's no observable diabetic retinopathy on exam on the slit lamp exam do you change your icd-10 diagnosis oh that's an interesting question to mild npdr or to something else i would you know in that case if i weren't if i I would. It, I, I guess it depends. It depends on the severity of what I'm finding. If it's one microvascular, you know, one one Irma um, or one MA, I might not bump up the, you know, the and everything else has been the same. I might not change anything. But if I'm seeing multiples, I'm seeing a, a pattern of them in an area. I will probably, I would probably go from mild to moderate. Um, I don't think the, the ETDRS guidelines. I don't think are something you can really lean on for that. Um, and um you know for me it's really the oh, how does it change my management um to me cpt coding and icd-9 coding are all about getting paid um and i don't get paid any differently whether it's mild moderate severe it's the same reimbursement it doesn't you know the, the medical decision making might change on my primary visit code because of the severity of things and the risk to the patient but um the the icd-10 code has nothing to do with how much i get paid it's just that i did this procedure because i saw this um, so it, it will drive my documentation as far as, you know, what I'm going to do for the patient much more than, than, uh, the ICD-10 code. Um, but I, I don't think you're wrong to, to bump up things if, you know, to a, a more severe level, if you see that. Right. And this brings up an interesting issue though. Of course, you're starting with OCTA to see these microvascular changes that you would never have seen before, right? So you're seeing these changes before any clinically significant disease presents itself. You know, you're probably the first person actually 
<laughs> that's seeing yeah. any sort of change, right? Even before they're their primary care physician. So how do you actually handle that in your office when you see something like that? What, what I do, I, I've got a letter that I send on my primary care docs about my diabetics. And I'll always make a reference to the foveal vascular zone. They don't know what that is probably, but they know I'm looking at it. And I'll say it's stable or it's it's worsened or, you know, there's a change that's not good. Um, or I'm seeing more perfusion dropout on angiography than, I, than I've seen in the past or than I knew was there before if it's if it's the first time I've done that with the patient. So on the communication level, I'm going to let the primary care doctor know about that. Um, I won't order an OCTA unless I've got something to, to you know, I'm not going fishing with my OCTA. Um, so there are usually I will see either either vascular beating, you know, I'm looking at the vasculature, which may may cause me to do something. I may not see hemorrhage or exudate, but if I'm seeing some significant vascular beating, um, I'm seeing significant atherosclerosis, um, I may order in a patient who's hypertensive and diabetic, I may order the OCTA basically because of the hypertension could risk, um, but I'm also going to get the diabetic information too. So you know, I don't I don't run a an OCT on every diabetic that comes into my office. Um, if I did, we'd probably burn the thing out. Um, <laughs> the way diabetes is up here in the Upper Midwest. Right. But um, but you know, when, when there's a reason to run it, and and a lot of these patients have some AMD or they have other things going on. So um, you know, I may and and when you do the 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 glaucoma scans, you're doing a a, a retinal and you're doing a six by six. OCTA on the macula, plus you're doing one on the nerve, a scan on the nerve in each eye. So you're getting all that data also. So right. you're kind of getting, you're not getting paid for it twice, but you're getting, you know, twice the useful data for the MAC, the Gen patient or the, the AMD patient. Right. Uh, interesting question here. So towards the end of the presentation, you <laughs> showed uh, some uh, color fundus photos that were actually pretty striking. Question here, is there a mode with the uh, device to, to correlate them or overlay them with the OCTA images to try to you know, correlate what you're seeing in both spots? There is. If, if you take a, a nerve photo when you do, um, which we don't typically do, but if you take it because we're getting a, a, a confocal image of on every patient that I'm going to look at, but if you take the fundus photo image uh, the, of the, the with the nerve, it will actually superimpose it above as the backdrop for the upper, upper um, uh, image in the report. So, yes, it will automatically put it together if they're there for the same visit. You don't have to tell it to do that. It automatically does that. Right. And question here, um, in terms of the actual use of the device, is this something that you do on your own or do you have your assistants actually acquire the scans? My, um, all, I have three employees. I have a small office and all three of them can run every device in the office. So um, I, I don't do it myself. If, if someone asks me for help, I usually say, why don't you ask the other one? Because they do it more than I do. I can use it. I went through the training on how to run the device, but my staff is who runs this for me. Um, and we've got a kind of unique setup in my office and I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole right now, but I, a lot of times in that room documenting, it's my office slash, it's got all the, the, the imaging technology in it. Um, and so if I, if I look at something and see something I want more info on, I may actually ask them to run another scan. It might just be another OCT or OCTA scan. Um, so, but my staff is who runs it. And it's, when we went from the Avanti to this, my staff were blown away by how much quicker and easier the Solix is than the Avanti. Not that the Avanti was a bad device, but this one's just that much easier. Right. And in terms of actually moving over from the Avanti, the user interface was, you know, it was pretty, pretty easy for them to actually adjust to this. It's different, but better. So, you know, what I've found, whether it's me clinically or it's the staff, in about six weeks, you forget what the old one was like. Um, so it was a little different, you know, it's it's similar. You create patients with name, you know, name, date of birth, EMR ID, and those sort of things. Um, and then the actual scanning is similar than the Avanti, but it's it's slightly different also, and in a lot of ways better. You have more more things you can look at and, and better cues for your Z axis. Are you in, in too far, are you out too far? And then cues for alignment also right on the screen. It, it shows you the tracking status right on the screen you're looking at. So it, it's much easier to operate for my staff. Right. Now here's an interesting question. I never really thought about this, but when you're moving from device to device and you have to compare data that you've captured, let's say even five years ago, how easy is that or has it been for you to do since you've moved to different OCTs to compare with, with prior data? 
What I've done historically, because the data, specifically, even though it was the Avanti was a, 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 a Visionics product and so was the Solix, because of the the scan patterns and the different densities in data, you, you can't do a comparison on an Avanti 6x6 scan and a Solix 6x6 scan. But what I've done historically is when I find the view that I want to, to save for, you know, to memorialize for that day's visit on my OCT or OCTA, I dump it and it goes, it, it goes into a, an image management system so I can put them right side by side. So I am doing an eyeball, an eyeball comparison, which I will not say is as good as a, a, a you know, statistical subtraction analysis um, that we'll be doing next time for progression analysis. Um, but it's not it's not as difficult as I thought it was going to be. Um, so like as I showed you overlaying the where I overlaid the scans, I don't physically do that with my patients, but I'll have the scans next to each other. Well, I can see what the OCTA, the angiolytics look like last time versus how they look this time. Um, and I use the 12 millimeter scan a lot, which didn't exist in the Avanti anyway. So um, it's kind of hard to make a one to one comparison on that. So it's it's a little bit of a learning curve, but it, it's not. It's not as bad as you'd think, but it is something you have to take into account. Right. Um, question here, and I don't think you're going to be the one to answer this, but folks at Visionics, um, hopefully they're still out there and listening. So question around pricing. Um, you, to acquire the device, what's the, the pricing model? How does it work? Um, do you buy the device? Do you lease it? How, how does that actually work? You buy the device and then finance it however you'd like. I mean, you could pay cash if you want. Um, or you know, use a lease or use a loan, whatever your accountant. You know, I would I would always get your accountant involved in those lease versus, you know, you're not leasing it from Visionics, you're buying it from them. But you know, whether you structure the the financial agreement as a lease with a lender or a buy with a lender, I'd talk to your accountant about any benefits to that. That's way beyond me. Um, and pricing is something I don't I don't really have a clue about. That's you know, but I'm sure Visionics can get people information on that. Right, so I think probably the best move is, um, you know, to contact Visionics and and have a rep contact you. Um, if after this webinar is over, if people you're going to get follow ups from me, uh, the system's going to shoot you an email. If you have any questions for Visionics, just fire uh, reply to that email, um, and I'll send it on over to them as well. So, um, and I don't know if any folks from Visionics want to chime in here as well. Uh, yeah, so if you go to visionics.com backslash US backslash ODWire, um, you can fill out the form on that page and I'll be able to connect you directly with your local sales rep and they can talk to you about uh, current specials, um, financing options. We do have a, uh, some lower financing through some of our providers, but you know, like Dr. Warren said, um, talk to your accountant and see what's best for you. Um, and then, you know, we can get you, you guys set up before the end of the year so you can take advantage of your Section 179, so. Great, okay, and, and I'll actually put a, uh, a link in the email, the follow-up email that I send out to everybody with that URL in it so people can get to it quickly as well. All right, well, it actually looks like we've used up the whole hour. So, so John, thank you for coming out and doing this tonight. I think we all, you know, learned a lot and got to see some really, uh, you know, really cool images as well. The one thing that, you know, we've been running this Solix series now for the better part of a year, and I'm still just blown away every time we do it by the, by the output of the system. So I hope everyone, uh, everyone else is also, um, you know, suitably impressed by, by what they're seeing. I, I, I learn something every week. Um, you know about better ways to analyze this or um you know there, there's so much data that's there it's not overwhelming in any way but there's just so many different ways to look at the data that you know i keep finding better and better ways to, to put it in my practice absolutely all right well john thank you for doing this tonight and uh thank you everyone for for coming out tonight and again if you have any questions an archive of this video will be posted on od wire for folks to watch a discussion thread will run right beneath it and feel free to chime in there and we can uh, get you any answers that you might need so so thanks again everyone and i guess i'll see everybody online thanks adam <laughs>